Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest this week is Kyle Carpenter. He's a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps who served this nation in Afghanistan. He is a recipient of the Medal of Honor, and he's also the author of the new book, You Are Worth It, Building a Life Worth Fighting For. Kyle, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, I know from reading your book that you moved around quite a bit as a kid, but uh, where do you consider home? South Carolina's home. Uh, I need to take the opportunity, though, to say I was born in Mississippi, so shout out to everyone in Mississippi, but South Carolina's home, uh, and recently, after graduating from school, I have moved to Charlotte. Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, is there a history of military service in your family before you? Uh, so my mom's dad was in the Navy. Unfortunately, he died when I was young, but other than him, uh, just me figuring out the life of service in the military, you know, on my own, but uh, it's been an amazing journey. So one of the things I read in your book was the, the tension, especially not too long after 9-11, of go to college or join the service. You really felt the calling and it was, it was a tough decision for your family and you even went to college briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about how you wrestled with that decision and ultimately you just felt like you had to join the service. Yeah, so I've always been scared of regret and I knew college was always going to be there, so I didn't want to, while feeling this calling to join the military, I didn't want to uh, not do that and wake up one day and regret having missed that opportunity. So I don't think anyone knows exactly what they're getting into with uh, a life of service and, and really a life of many unknowns. Uh, but you know, I'm thankful I made the decision I did. I would absolutely do it again. And um, yeah, I wanted to do something that was of a greater purpose and bigger than myself or any one individual. Why did you pick the Marine Corps? Uh, I picked the Marine Corps and, you know, to help my parents <clears throat> uh, understand that. I was trying to be respectful of them. I went to many different recruiters, all of the branches, and I really you know, self-reflected and thought about it. But at the end of the day, I joined the Marine Corps because I wanted, uh, I had always welcomed challenge growing up, whether blowing bubbles, sitting in the recliner with my dad, with gum or on the football field in high school. Never really externally, just always with myself, always trying to get faster, stronger, better. And so when I thought about the Marine Corps, I wanted something that would push me to and hopefully beyond those limits that I knew. And you know, with that, do something that really made me look deep down inside myself you know, to make it that next step or push through whatever is in my way. So uh, safe to say, I, I believe that the Marine Corps would do that, and it did. <laughs> right from the start, right? I mean, yeah. Paris Island, you talk about it in the book of coming onto the island, and, and once you were in the camp or something, they blindfolded you so you didn't know how to get out. And it's, it's, Yeah, driving up to the gate, put yeah. your head down in between your legs. So. If and when you go crazy or try to run away, you don't know the one and only little windy road on and off the island to, uh, to escape through the swamps, I guess you could say. What was your moment of being broken, as they say there? You talk about it in the book. Yeah, it wasn't, hey, you're talking about boot camp? Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it was a simple foot drill movement, but it was towards the end of boot camp I had uh, thankfully uh, been a squad leader for uh, most of boot camp except for about the first week. And I think just, you know, like everyone, you know, everyone breaks, I, I think, and, and just going through it every day. And then also, maybe punished isn't the right word, but suffering even more if you're a squad leader because anytime someone in your squad messes up you uh, share the punishment with them so I think just after you know, 10 11 weeks of that uh, and, and 
you know, if it was just me out there going through that over and over because I kept messing it up, I think it would have been a different story. But seeing a direct correlation of even that simple foot drill movement, I messed that up as a squad leader at the very front of the squad. And then the rest of my squad suffered for it. And we all got off step. And so it wasn't just my mistake now. And it was a, a good lesson. And as simple as it was, it made me realize that even the smallest of things affects all of the Marines around you. And so, yeah, I, don't, <laughs> I broke kind of in that moment. And I was just so not only hot in the middle of summer on Paris Island and getting eaten alive by bugs, uh, but uh, just messing it up over and over just in a frustrated type of way. Wow. So it wasn't too long after that. Uh, was it was the summer of 2010. You get deployed to Afghanistan. Correct. And you're in the 2-9, mm -hmm. so 2nd Marine Division. Um, and you go to Helmand Province. What's your first impression of the place? Before we even touched down, I vividly remember we were in the back of uh, MH 53, uh, Marine Helicopter Super Stallion. And the back was open. I mean, we were on the last leg, day number 10 of our journey from the States to our small patrol base outpost that we were going to be living and operating for that deployment. And so being in that environment, the back is open. You have a door gunner. I'm a little rusty. It might be open all the time. But uh, I remember looking back and seeing the door gunner and looking out of the back of that helicopter. And two things were so surreal that I, it still doesn't even feel real thinking about it and talking about it. But I remember looking out and seeing just patches and different shades of brown and green and farmland. And I remember thinking, like, am I going to step on an IED in that field? Or am I going to bleed out in that canal? And it wasn't a scared thought. It was just, wow, after, depending on how you look at it, my entire life leading up to this moment, my you know year to year and a half of training before we we got on the plane to come to Afghanistan. And so it was kind of actually happening and we were really in Afghanistan. And the second piece was uh, the crew chief, who a crew chief rides in the back of the helicopter. He's obviously part of the crew, but he communicates with the pilots, make sure everyone's buckled in, make sure it's as smooth as ride as possible for all the Marines in the back. And, uh, you know, at this point, we had been going through bases. We hadn't touched down, you know, really outside of friendly lines or any bases yet. And so we didn't have ammunition. And I remember the crew chief is obviously extremely loud, but uh, as I'm looking out the back, I'm interrupted by this crew chief handing me belts of ammo for my saw. And at 20 years old saying, hey, you know, we're probably going to take contact before we even touch down. I'm thinking like, this is so surreal and this is crazy. Uh, but that really, uh, I guess, set the tone for the entire deployment. Uh, obviously, I survived for four months out of our seven month deployment. But for that four months, uh, we were living primitively. You know, the first two months or so we were there, slept on the ground, no showers for the entire deployment. And every single day from sunup to sundown was uh, a fight for survival. And it was never a matter of, I uh, wonder if we're going to get shot at today. It was a matter of when. And uh, every single day from sunup to sundown was, was a fight. We'll talk about obviously the day that changed your life in, in a moment, but even before that, um, there's a gripping incident where you come under fire and you actually get shot, but somehow the bullet bounces off of you and you're basically left with only a bruise, but uh, some of your other uh, teammates weren't so lucky. Yeah, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, um, 
But yeah, it was our very first patrol and you work down leadership wise. So we had been in country for four or five days at this point. Um, but when you get there, you send out your platoon sergeant and your most likely a lieutenant, a platoon commander. They interact with the Marines that have been there on the ground, go on patrols, get a feel for the area. Uh, and then you work your way down. So it was time for me to go on this patrol, stepped out of friendly lines, and roughly an hour after uh, getting outside of, of our patrol base, we um, came under our first attack, and it was our first firefight of the deployment. And uh, I was laying at the end of a road uh, at a dead end, but looking through my scope and uh, trying to cover as much of the field in front of us, which obviously would be an avenue of approach for the enemy as possible. And uh, I'm laying up against uh, this wall, and it was a shed like many of the compounds over there have to dry out their crops, help process the drugs that fund Taliban and, and uh, uh, terrorist activities. <clears throat> and uh, it happened so suddenly. You know, they, the enemy opened up, initiated this attack, and it was the one and only time I ever laid down behind my saw the entire four-month deployment. From that moment on, every single firefight, I shot from the standing or the kneeling because during this first engagement, I was laying on the ground and I remember I couldn't even really see around me or see through my scope because of so many rounds and hitting the ground around me, dust being kicked up. And one of those rounds uh, came in, impacted the wall of the shed that I was lying in front of, and thankfully took enough momentum out of the round uh, that when it did ricochet and come down and of course hit the three inch space where I didn't have body armor and down to uh, where my belt line started, uh, it did hit me in the lower back and I thought I was hit. And I remember saying I was hit telling my fellow Marines, grabbing my weapon, and running backwards to cover. And uh, it turned out to be, I guess you could just think of it as a bad paintball hit. Uh, but I just remember as I was running back thinking like, no way, I cannot get taken out. You know, I can't leave my guys first firefight, really first day of my deployment and most of ours. And so uh, that was, uh, an eye-opening experience that really set the precedent for the days and months that would follow. Kyle, let's get to November 21st, uh, 2010. This is um, the day that you were wounded, the day that your actions ultimately uh, resulted in the Medal of Honor. Um, so you and a buddy named Nick, is it Euphrasio? Correct. Okay, you're on a roof in Helmand Province and Take the story from there. Yeah, so the compound we were in, we had only been there for roughly two days. We had moved in on November 19th. And uh, because I've got asked a lot, like, why were you at a different place than you had been living and operating? But we were at four months out of our seven month deployment and looking ahead to that next unit of Marines relieving you so you can go home. Before they get there, you want to, like everything in life, leave it better than you found it at your area of operation. So to push the bad guys out even further, to create more stability, hopefully, uh, you want to expand your area of operation, hold that ground. Now, it might be very beginning steps of that stability and foundation, but regardless, you know, the... The idea is you keep expanding and capitalizing on every deployment of Marines and you know eventually uh, you just continue to grow your area of operation. And so uh, there were three villages to the south of patrol base Beatley and the village that we had lived and operated for those four months. But on November 19th, myself and just my squad, which a squad is roughly 12 Marines with a Navy corpsman 
who we rely on for medical care attached. We hiked down to do just that, to take over a compound, you know, put our foot in the ground and try to survive and hold that ground. And so Marines always have Marines on watch, on guard duty. And that was uh, the job and the shift that my fellow Marine and I were on on top of that roof. As they did every day, the in enemy initiated daylight attack. And until the past few days, we had not seen hand grenades throughout our deployment. You know, Afghanistan, especially Marja, we were fighting across fields and tree line to tree line and canal to canal. And so unlike Iraq, which uh, more of the fighting was urban environments, house to house and street to street, closer proximity to throw grenades. But Afghanistan, we had uh, not got that close on a consistent enough basis to be able to throw hand grenades. But uh, we were towards the end of our four hour shift and it was mid afternoon. And the attack started. Uh, everything I am about to say is not from, I think they quickly learned through the investigation that uh, I don't remember anything really from the entire day and arguably the two days up until you know I got hit. Uh, but three grenades were thrown to start the attack. I don't remember uh, those three, which all were thrown within the compound and inside the walls. The fourth was thrown and landed in very close proximity to me and Nick on that roof. I don't remember seeing the grenade, thinking about it. Uh, all I remember is physically how I felt after. Later, after many years and a, over a 250 page, very thorough and extensive investigation done by the Marine Corps and Department of Defense, it was determined uh, and also from eyewitness testimonies and uh, a, a uh, post-blast analysis and forensics done by uh, explosive ordnance disposal team on my gear in the area of the blast. It was determined that I covered the grenade for my fellow Marine. But physically how I felt after is the first thing was just pure confusion and disorientation. I couldn't see anything. It was as if I was looking at a TV with no connection, just white and gray static. My ears were ringing, uh, extremely loud. Uh, and that was interrupted by what I thought was, and this will allude to Marine's humor, but my buddies pouring warm water all over me. And I was thinking, really guys? Like in this banged up state I'm in, you're messing with me right now. But that final kind of question mark piece allowed for the other ones to fall in place to give me the surreal and unfortunate realization that what I was feeling was not warm water, that it was blood and I was profusely bleeding out. And I knew from physically how I felt, uh, in addition to the medical training we received before we deploy, and unfortunately the casualties that I had seen up until that point on deployment, I knew that my time was limited. So I thought about my family, uh, specifically my mother who would be uh, you know, beyond devastated that I did not survive to make it home. I said a quick prayer for forgiveness and anything I had done wrong and that was followed by a tiredness that completely consumed me and is uh, I feel impossible to recount but I became extremely exhausted and I you know, thought those were my final moments and I faded from consciousness in the world on that uh, hot dusty rooftop in Afghanistan and I woke up roughly five weeks later uh, and my first sight was slowly opening that only I had left to Christmas stockings that my mom had hung on my hospital room wall decorating my room for Christmas with snow outside on my window and I had no idea where I was but waking up 
on the other side of the world at Walter Reed really was the start of my journey. Now, there was many journeys that helped keep me alive and helped me get to where I am today before I even woke up. But that started my journey and my three-year recovery at Walter Reed and really my journey of figuring out this new life and body that I have been dealt and um, how to reclaim it and make the most of it. Kyle, I could talk to you about your story for hours and unfortunately we don't have that much time, but um, you talk in the book about this amazing series of miracles shortly after you're injured, starting with the excellent work of the medic. Um, Doc Friend is an interesting, uh, appropriate name, uh, I think, obviously. Uh, and then the fact that there just happened to be a medevac chopper nearby. And the one that absolutely staggers the mind is that the, the Navy corpsman was trying to help you by giving you his last little thing of morphine, mm -hmm. and it didn't work, but that ended up being a huge plus. Explain what happened there. Yeah. So I talk about in the book, uh, you're correct, a, a domino of miracles, and everyone happening at the perfect time and place with the perfect people. Um, and yeah, it, it's almost too crazy to comprehend how everything happened from that medevac with one space for a casualty on it, already in route to the hospital and they just happened to be flying by. Uh, and then my Marines, Doc Friend, my medevac arrived in 12 minutes, a second miracle. But, uh, you know, as we were waiting on that, and I don't remember this, but talking to my buddies after, my legs, the small amount of tissue damage they had compared to the rest of me were not a priority. But my buddies, from what they told me, they just kind of had the thought of, hey, it couldn't hurt. While we have the combat galls and the time, might as well wrap away. So they wrapped my legs. And as I was going to be put on that medevac, Doc Friend went to go give me his, his last morphine um, shot, I guess. And uh, we only had one left because of the amount of casualties we had had up until that point on deployment. And uh, he went to go uh, administer that last morphine shot, and the very small and fragile needle caught that combat gauze on my leg, and it bent it, and uh, he wasn't uh, able to administer it. And now, after going through the steps of the medevac process and back to the United States, not only did we learn that I had to be resuscitated three times, but when I arrived at the combat trauma hospital, I was labeled PEA, which is pulseless electrical activity. And uh, they told me that if I would have received any morphine, that it would have depressed my respiratory system to the point of being unrecoverable. And so that is one of many you know, over not only those first few weeks, but over the course of my three-year recovery and really um, my nine years of a journey since then. But really, and I'm thankful that I was able to write this book for many reasons, but one of those being to thoroughly uh, and appropriately explain just how deep not only my appreciation for everyone that helped keep me alive, but how amazing is it and, and all of the pieces and parts that fell together perfectly like those dominoes to um, not only keep me alive, but for the most part keep me in one piece and, and um, you know, get me back here seven days later to start recovering and, and again reclaiming this new life that I had woken up to. 
all those prayers from your hometown were definitely answered. Oh, they, they played a part for sure. In that sequence. And then you talk about all the surgeries you went through in Afghanistan, uh, the chaplain you met at Longstuhl, who was actually from your own backyard. Yeah. And then I think the one that will really make a lot of readers emotional is when you're flying from Longstuhl back to the United States, and there was a mom who was with her son on board, and you happened to be on there too, pretty much out of it, and what happened? So the lady's name is Jennifer Miller, and her son, Ryan Craig, was on a deployment to Afghanistan, and unfortunately uh, was shot in the head. And it's amazing that this story even occurred and that I was able to write about it and that we even know Jennifer now, who's a dear friend, because I don't think people know, but you don't go to Germany to meet your loved ones and service members unless the prognosis is not good. So you know, imagine as a mother flying over, having to, you know, this might not be the, the easiest way to put it, but to pull the plug on your own child. Ryan continued to fight and pull through, not only pull through, but continue to survive and get better. And so being a nurse and having that background and being his mother, you know, they asked and, and they love families and, and you know they get it as service members and obviously as family members somewhere and, and who are deployed. So they asked her, hey, you know, you want to ride back on our medevac flight? And myself and Ryan were the two most severely injured casualties on board. We had an entire uh, doctor and nurse team, each to ourselves individually, and an entire ICU bay essentially set up in the back of this, uh, in the back of this military plane. And during the flight, uh, she heard me moaning as she listened and got closer she realized I was saying mom and so she knew what she had to do so she sat in between us and if they were not working on either one of us which was rare she would hold both of our hands if they were working on Ryan she would give me attention and vice versa but uh, yeah just a story that still almost too powerful for words but you know I hope I made them proud and uh, I'm thankful that I could share that with people to really make people think you know just because we survive off the battlefield not only does it end there and everything's fine but you know it's a it's a long uh, dark scary and painful journey at times and it's not just us going through it it's military families and and our loved ones who stay by the bed and hold our hands conscious or not and so uh you know i hope uh i hope uh you know and you did and i'm thankful that you took that from the book and that you appreciate that and i, I hope everyone does because it is a a powerful story and i'm glad to be able to share any veteran story but you know Ryan is not only a great dude but his mom Jennifer she's amazing and actually throughout this book writing process uh, some really neat things happened I was able to track down my medevac crew and I was able to go back to Launchstuhl in Germany and speak to the staff there and tell them thank you most of whom were not there when we came through but you know they always receive the worst of the worst and do everything they can to keep us alive and then send us on our way always wondering you know were we able to save his leg is he ever able to walk again did he survive to make it home to his family and uh, it just so happened that after nine years of well eight years at the time of waiting and being asked every year by a nonprofit group from Walter Reed hey do you want to go back and uh, not only do a reunion, but visit Launchstuhl and, and go to Germany. And uh, it just so happened that we both finally felt up to it, had the time and agreed. And myself, my mom, Ryan, and Jennifer 
all got to uh, walk the halls of Longstow in the ICU where they saved us. And uh, Jennifer was able to sit there and tell my mom, you know, here's where I waited. Here's where I got updates. This is where I sat. And this is the waiting room I was in. And you know, this is the process of how we left. And I got on the flight with them. So it was amazing, to say the least. You have an amazing family, and I encourage people to pick up the book for that, among many other reasons, because you talk about them uh, in amazing ways in this book. Um, so it was really at Walter Reed, I'm guessing, then, that you fully understood the extent of your injuries. Mm -hmm. um, Still not knowing what happened. Exactly. But yeah, waking up to uh, a long list of uh, injuries and things that had had been altered uh, and and changed during those five weeks that I was unconscious. What was the, and how many surgeries did you end up undergoing? <sighs> Me and mom lost the battle of trying to keep count, <laughs> but if I had to guess, I would say uh, roughly 40. And a lot of them had to do with the jaw, correct? Uh, yeah, facial reconstruction and um, surgeries and reconstruction by my oral maxillofacial team. Now you talk in the book, Ryan, about um, how, at least in that first stint at Walter Reed, you didn't feel like you were like emotionally overwhelmed at first. But when you got home, and there was the huge hometown welcome home, and uh, another moment just with your mom, talk about how the, the stress of that ultimately got, uh, affected you. Yeah, so coming home after being in that stable, calm, quiet of a hospital environment to your neighborhood's field. Uh, you know, cameras are going off everywhere. Like, it was amazing. It was just a lot. But then once I got inside, things calmed back down again. It was quiet again. There was a point, and and also for people listening that are like why was he home so early on in his recovery after I got done with my first three months in the hospital I got my trach out I got off the machines that were help helping keep me alive and so at that time in early 2011 there was so many casualties unfortunately coming back that Walter Reed was so full I remember at one point and it was only for a day or two but they were putting patients in the hallway and setting up their beds in the hallway. So with that said, uh, some of us that they knew, uh, I think that they could kind of trust to go on an extended leave back home, uh, but also people they knew that, and Marines that they knew had a long road to recovery that would have to come back to Walter Reed no matter what. They allowed us, and myself specifically, you know, once they kind of stabilized us, made sure that we we're alive and well, uh, they allowed us to go home with the understanding that we would recover at home, I would get mom's good food, relax on the couch with my dog, uh, with the understanding that I would do therapy at a local hospital at home, and every week or two I would um, drive, my mom would drive me, back up to Walter Reed to do surgeries. And that was the kind of schedule until we were waiting for that September of 2011 for an incredible, very spacious, like many rooms. It's called Building 62, but it's a new wounded warrior, or at the time was a new wounded warrior living facility and a nice apartment style barracks, not your usual Marine Corps barracks that were opening uh, to make space for, for the influx of wounded warriors. And so early spring of 2011, I had just left the hospital and I was at home. And one night around 10 o'clock, I was struggling to say the least to make a bowl of cereal. Like it was probably a half gallon jug of milk, but it was so heavy. like. I hadn't had the nerve surgeries on my arms or hands yet. Um, I had very little function. My face, I couldn't feel it, one, because of the nerve damage, two, the grenade blew most of my teeth out. And so all around, just 
a struggle. I finally get the bowl of cereal made and I'm sitting at the kitchen counter and uh, I think it wasn't the, the struggle of making that bowl of cereal or I wasn't in pain or anything like that that made me break. I think while trying to eat it, milk was going everywhere. Not only was it hard to make the bowl, but it was almost impossible to eat it. But the main component, I, I think, was I had tried to stay so strong and positive and like thumbs up all day every day for my parents, my doctors, everyone who was with me for those first three months at Walter Reed because the hardest part of my recovery was the burden of knowing that my parents were suffering through my recovery with me. And not only did they not ask for it, you know, I know their parents, they love me. They reassured me every day that it was their honor to take care of me and, and, and get me better. But it's still hard to know that your parents are really struggling seeing their not only firstborn son completely blown apart, but to really see me suffering every single second of every day that I was awake. And so uh, I think knowing all of that in that moment with milk going all over my face, I broke. And uh, it was by far my lowest point and I was crying and mom came into the kitchen and uh, she rightfully so thought I was in pain. Immediately gave me a hug asking me what's wrong and I just asked her, who's ever gonna love me again? And uh, it was a very tough moment, but one that I'm thankful for because I realized after a few minutes of, of crying and, and having that, that kind of breakdown moment, uh, I realized that it's okay to not only have those moments, but to take your time with your unique struggle to anyone. That was just my situation. It's okay to take that time to heal and, and to have those breakdown moments, but I'm thankful that you know, minutes later I realized you cut out all the noise in life and anytime you're presented an opportunity, you really only have two options. I could have chose, which I'm thankful I did, to get up and take that small step. Or in a way I could have sat at that kitchen counter for the rest of my life. So I chose to get up and take that step and chose to reclaim my life. And uh, I had no idea not only what I was doing at the time, I didn't know how long I was gonna be recovering I didn't really even know what the next day or therapy session held. And I think, uh, I'm glad I had that realization as well because I think a lot of people get so wrapped up in, oh, I don't have a plan, or I don't really know like where I'm going in life, and that's fine. A lot of times it's just taking that small step forward and, and uh, in good time, putting the next one right after it. And that's a big part of this book, too. You didn't want to just tell your story and the amazing people that have helped you along the way. It's what you learned along the way and your encouragement to other people going through trials of whatever kind mm -hmm. uh, to stay motivated, don't hide your scars, call your mom, of course, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. We're so short on time, but I have to get this story in real quick. Um, talk about, real briefly, learning that you were going to officially receive the medal and what that day was like at the White House with President Obama. So, uh, it was interesting. I was a sophomore in college. I had done my three years of recovery uh, and the calls started coming towards the end. Oh, what year was it? Uh, 2000, very end of 2013, looking ahead to spring in early summer of 14 when I received the medal. Uh, at first it was just, how's life going? Where are you at? What are you doing? Checking up on me. Things quickly got uh, official. 
as the investigation got to a point high enough where not even the Marine Corps really knew where it was at, if it was going to happen. But no matter what, if it did or did not, we had to prepare. And so, uh, you know, I had amazing Marines I, at the time. Uh, I believe she was a major, but Kendra Motes, uh, really not only a great Marine, but has become a great friend and she really sat me down and said hey I know school's your priority I know you want to do good and keep good grades and this is where you're at in life now but if this happens not only do we need to adequately prepare but school is you know, potentially could become a burden and I don't want you to to give that up you know for this kind of short term thing that we have to do so I thought about it I decided to wait and get the call, which came in February from the president. That kind of uh, verified what was happening. And so I had got out of class, drove home roughly 30 minutes to Lexington, South Carolina, so I could sit in the living room with my family and my brothers who were in high school at the time and share that moment with them. But I got the call from the president. He told me um, you know, not only was he proud of me and what my fellow Marines did, but that based upon the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of Defense's recommendations, he was proud to going to be uh, awarding me the Medal of Honor. And um, you know, from that moment to being in the White House and having him drape the medal around my neck, until now, I'm thankful and I think proud to say that I don't feel like the medal has affected or changed um, me as a person. I feel like I'm the same kid that was like playing in kickball in middle school. But what it has done is it's uh, given me a unique perspective. I think that thankfully and fortunately most people don't have and most service members don't have. And that is, you know, at the time, not only was out in the middle of my college career, uh, but when the medal happened, everything was so just beyond chaotic. I mean, you could barely, even just during the ceremony, not to mention the media tour after, you could barely hear yourself think because of the cameras going off in the back of the room. So in that moment, of course, I've always known that it's not my medal or any individual's, but I needed time to continue to, one, heal mentally and emotionally, even though I was out of the hospital, and two, think deeply and reflect on what it really means and represents. And over the years, I've come to realize that, yes, it represents my story, my family's journey of serving and sacrificing with me, you know, beyond that, my fellow Marines that were there on the ground with me, those that served and sacrificed, and then those that gave their last full measure of devotion for their country. Go beyond that, you think about the families that will always be missing a loved one, the kids that uh, won't have a parent uh, to make them that bowl of cereal, to you know, get them on the bus or off to school, help them with their homework. Beyond that, the people of Afghanistan that I saw every day, you know, the look in their eyes of just wanting to hopefully one day, just one day wake up and taste peace and freedom and know what that feels like and to be able to want to learn how to read and be able to do that without fearing death at the end of the day. You know, beyond that, it represents the past generations of service members and Marines who not only raised their right hand, but in fields of Vietnam covered grenades for their fellow Marines, who at 16, 17, 18, 19 years old charged the beaches of Iwo Jima and the beaches and islands throughout the Pacific and were told that probably not even going to make it off the landing craft. And if you do, you're probably not going to survive to make it on 
you know, to the beach. And they did that and charged for it anyway. And, you know, above all of that, those that not only gave that last full measure of devotion, but that are still missing in action. And we can't tell their families uh, how, they, how they gave that ultimate sacrifice. So it's heavy. Uh, it's a beautiful burden. But I am thankful and, and humbled and profoundly grateful that I was recognized and told thank you by my country. But, you know, I feel like I'm just uh, an instrument to educate those who haven't raised their right hand and honor those that have. Kyle, our time's gone, but thank you very much for being with us today. And most of all, thank you for your incredible service to our country. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Kyle Carpenter is a U.S. Marine Corps veteran, served in Afghanistan, recipient of the Medal of Honor. His book is entitled You Are Worth It, Building a Life Worth Fighting For. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.